Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to um, this shared virtual space um, and also this tiny corner of my bedroom. Um, my name is Lee Rayford. I'm an associate professor of African American Studies at UC Berkeley um, and with Lauren Kreis, um, you see waving there, is um, who's associate professor of history of art and the faculty director of the Hearst Museum of Anthropology. Um, together, we're the co-instructors of LNS 25. Um, the course is called Public Art and Belonging. And today's event is, um, I don't know, the sixth or seventh and the third um, in our in a zoom via zoom in a series of public lectures and conversations that we've organized as part of this course. Um, when the course uh, generally obviously met at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Ar Film Archive Osher Theater um, and we always started start the class with a land acknowledgement um, cons in considering that public art and belonging we recognize that our class takes place on the ancestral, or took place then on the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. We acknowledge and pay respect to Ohlone ancestors, peoples today, and the Ohlone future to come. Um, and Pretty much wherever you're joining us from, you're on the ancestral and unceded land of indigenous peoples. And so this is also, we also invite everyone to take the opportunity to learn where, where you are situated. Um, so this lecture series in the course explores relationships between art and belonging, race and place, history, memory, and the imagining of just futures. And you know, so much of obviously the course was organized around um, being out in public together, um, finding ways that we could take up space, share space, hold space. And so many of um, our conversations really embrace that. And, and in this new moment, there, I think on one hand, we both thought this, it felt weird and delusional and kind of, um, you know, a little bit like, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic to continue with this course or continue with these conversations. Um, but it also seems in many ways more important than ever that we find ways to connect with each other to still imagine um, how we belong. We think about how, how place matters, how we um, can be together uh, even as we're apart and also in this moment that we really do get to imagine a just new and just futures. Um, you can find, um, so today we're joined by artist, Oakland-based artist Sadie Barnett um, and San Francisco experimental space programmer, Dina Beard. Um, you can find our previous events at the Berkeley Arts Plus Design YouTube channel page. Um, I don't know what it's called. We still call it the Zoom, so whatever. Um, but you can find conversations with Oakland-based artists and activists Jesus Barraza and Melanie Cervantes of Dignidad Rebelde. Um, last week we did a conversation with Al Alvin Ailey dance director Ronnie Favors. Um, you'll also find previous events that were in the theater, including our author and activist Jeff Chang, artists, Bay Area artist Lava Thomas and Mildred, uh, or Lava Thomas and Mildred Howard, um, director of Monument Lab, Paul Farber, architect and designer, Rodney Leone. And on Thursday, we'll be joined by Cafe Ohlone co-founders, Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino. And next week, um, artist Knupa Hanska Luger in collaboration with Arts Research Center will join us. Um, so of course, I also have to um, thank the numerous people and institutions um, that have made uh, this this event possible um, through financial, logistical, and uh, other support. The course is part of a series of thinking through Art Plus Design at Berkeley, supported by the Office of Arts Plus Design, a campus initiative under pr uh, Professor Shannon Jackson, um, and uh, that provides all of the funding for the course. Um, 
So we just want to thank them um, and also want to thank all of you for joining us today. So um, Sadie Barnett, um, we're very excited to have you here. This is a Sadie and Dina. We've been uh, when we first conceived this course, Sadie Barnett and Dina Beard were um, among the first people that we wanted to invite. And we've done a lot of sort of reorganizing and they've been really patient with us um, as we kind of work through all of, through the cost of living adjustment strike, um, as well as um, uh, kind of moving offline or online to teaching. Um, one of the things that's so powerful about um, their collaboration um, well, let me introduce them first, give you some background. Sadie um, Barnett is from Oakland, California. She earned her BFA from Cal Arts and an MFA from UC San Diego. Her work has been exhibited throughout the United States and internationally and is in the permanent collections of museums, uh, including LACMA, uh, BAM PFA, the California African American Museum in LA, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, the Perez Art Museum in Miami, the Studio Museum in Harlem, where she was also an artist in residence, uh, the Brooklyn Museum and the Guggenheim. She is the recipient of Art Matters and Artadia Awards and has been featured in publications including the New York Times, the LA Times, Art Forum, and Vogue. Uh, she lives in Oakland, California, and I assume that's where you are sheltering in place <laughs> and joining us. Uh, and then she's represented by Charlie James Gallery in Los Angeles. Dina Beard is executive director of the lab in San Francisco. She received her MA in art history, theory, and criticism from the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, of Chicago, um, and was uh, previously assistant curator at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Her work at the lab considers the exhibition and performance space as a site to investigate and dismantle systems of perception. Dina has organized exhibitions and projects with Dora Garcia, Ellen Fullman, Fritzia Irizar, uh, Jacqueline Gordon, Brontes Purnell, Constance Hockaday, Wadada Leo Smith, Barry McGee, and a whole host of others. So last year, Dina and Sadie collaborated to bring Sadie's project, the new Eagle Creek Saloon, to the lab. Um, and as I said, um, so we wanted them to come and, and talk about that collaboration and the importance um, the kind of um, the kind of world it opens up and the kind of ra radical caretaking involved in both um, Sadie's work in the New Eagle Creek Salon, um, uh, Saloon and in the lab. Um, but I think also what strikes me as really important and powerful is that while um, this crisis that we are experiencing now is very specific to this moment, it's also in many ways durational. Um, and in that um, all of the kinds of inequities and suffering that we are witnessing and experiencing just is kind of compounding all of, uh, sort of ongoing conditions of crisis. Um, and I think the work of the new Eagle Creek Saloon and of the, of the lab have long been projects that have tried to imagine new worlds, um, have tried to hold a different kind of space in the face of these kinds of durational crises. Um, and so with that, um, I actually wanna start by, uh, with the question that we have asked every one of our guests um, who've come as a way to kind of ground us and get us started. Um, but, but how do you both define public art? And why does public art matter in this moment? And so I'm gonna turn it over to, to Dina and Sadie with that question. And I think, um, Dina, we just need you to unmute yourself. There we go. Very good. All right, Sadie, do you, do you want to go first or should I? You can go if you <laughs> got something. <laughs> I, um, I have a kind of fumbling answer, but it's, it's, um, it's very real to me, but it's, it's not quite a, a definition, more of a, a, a type of behavior, I would say. I say bub public art is, um, is a way of being together that that changes, that changes the way that we see each other, that changes the way that we can occupy space with one another. Um, it allows us to start 
to be with each other towards freedom. Um, and I think that project of, of being with each other and towards freedom is something that involves a lot of pain, but it also involves a lot of celebration and pleasure. It involves a lot of seeing the world differently and disrupting the world that we know it, the kind of status quo feeling that we get from the world at this moment. So um, if that behavior often appears in many different circumstances and contexts, so it's not necessarily um, siloed in the sphere of the art world, and it's definitely not a financial instrument. So, mm -hmm. so much of, of what we see in the art, in the arts right now, looks and feels and sounds like a financial instrument. It is something that is put in place to kind of ratify the status quo, to allow the market to continue and um, to replicate itself and reproduce itself. But public art, as I feel it and know it and have experienced it from um, my very uh, my, my very lucky point of view is a, a space in which we can experience pain and joy together um, simultaneously. And it's a very, very difficult proposition. And it's a very beautiful one as well, because it allows us to re-see our world together. So it's kind of an awkward definition. Not at all. <laughs> Not awkward at all. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, to be honest, um, I haven't spent as much time thinking about public art as you might think considering my recent project, but it really just kind of um, announced itself and demanded, you know, to be the vessel for this project. Um, but, you know, when I step back and think about it, I think it, it doesn't matter more or less than anything else except for what you bring to it and, and how you use it, um, just like any job or form or vessel. Um, it's really just a container for what, um, a container for a whole bunch of, you know, possibilities. Um, so what, will you tell us a little bit about then how your, um, actually let's back up a little bit. So Dina, you've worked across a range of institutions, um, including Bamfa, um, and, a consistent thread in your curatorial practice seems to be making sure art has a living context um, and this commitment to, to being together, um, uh, being together towards freedom. Um, so can you describe a little bit the history um, of the lab and your work to rescue it from closing and the kinds of transformations you've made in the programming and in the space itself since your arrival um, in 2014, is that right? 2014, yes. Yeah, it's a, um, I'll try to keep it, do the concatenated version, but the, uh, the, the lab was a wonderful kind of punk space from when I got here from the 2007 to 2014. I went to a bunch of noise shows there. It's on 16th and Cap Street, so it's right in the heart of the Mission District. It can be easily missed. A lot of people didn't know it existed. Um, a lot of people still don't know it exists. Uh, it's in this beautiful old union meeting hall, uh, but it had been it had been around for 30, 30 years when I took it over, and it had been run by artists the majority of the time. Um, a couple of directors came in and managed it fairly well, and then it some at some point in time it, it started kind of unraveling and things um, as the city started gentrifying more and more and living expenses got more expensive. I think it was just more difficult to for artists to split their time between running a space and running an institution and also maintaining a practice and doing that sort of thing. So I think the luxury of the alternative art space in the 60s and 70s, that time is over or was over. <laughs> Hopefully we can return to it at some in some way, shape or form. Uh, but when, when after the 2008 crisis, it was very clear that spaces like the lab were, um, were very vulnerable and were failing. Mm -hmm. And we saw the closure of about 50% of our alternative art spaces in the past decade. So it's a huge amount. It's a huge loss of square footage for public gathering, of space for us to see each other's work, of experimentation, of actually just, you know, being wild with each other. So I was witnessing this on the sidelines while I was at the Ber Berkeley Art Museum. Um, you know, I had, I had a nice 
a nice job and it was a very it was a very uh it was a very um it was a very easy space to to make work from and to do a curatorial practice from but i also began to see that we weren't actually I, w I didn't feel like we were making the social contribution or the contribution materially to the artist's well-being in a city mm -hmm. that was clearly pushing artists out mm -hmm. um, and in an area that was clearly not hospitable to the arts in the way that I like to think of them. So I, in order to actually have a real relationship and a living organic relationship to artwork that continually challenges me and allows me to change and grow as a human being, I thought it was absolutely necessary to change the context and the circumstances through which I did, um, I curated. So taking over the lab um, at that moment was absolutely insane. It was $150,000 in debt. It was basically closed. It hadn't paid IRS taxes for um, five years. And um, it had burned a lot of bridges with artists, with people, simply because of the lack of payment and the confusion around what it was for and who it was for. So I decided if, if I was gonna take over this space, it had, to be it had to be a complete aesthetic reset. And the beauty of the, where the lab is housed right now is it's in this old union building that was built in 1914. It was a site of the 1934 general strike. So already at that moment, you look at this building or I look at this building and I know that that was a space that offered free daycare. It had a vaudeville theater, it had um, a restaurant facility, it had um, medical offices and dental offices. From 1914 to 1968, you could get all of these things with your union dues. So the fact that we have regressed or mm -hmm. lost those, those possibilities is absolutely insane to me. So figuring out how art could be housed in a building that once had uh, once showed us the kind of freedom that we could provide for each other and the kind of care that we could provide for each other was really inspiring. So I went about the, the kind of ridiculous task of trying to create um, and build the space back up. And it was really a, a task of excavation of just saying, hey, this is what was here. This is what could be here. This is what was here. You know, like let's mirror it and try to try to return to that flavor. So um, uh, we had a 24-hour telethon. We managed to raise $50,000. We completely wow. aesthetically reset the space. We, um, I personally sanded all the floors and refinished them. And it was, it was just a beautiful kind of collective effort of just making that, that um, I think of about 42 volunteers helped me throughout the first few weeks of getting it back on its feet. And then at that point, I just started putting people on payroll and I started insisting on this model that was, you know, absolutely bananas at the time, not, a, not just for the lab, but, you know, in the, in the nation, there wasn't really a model for an alternative art space to offer artists 25000 to $100,000 each to do whatever they wanted. And so that has been the model that I've been trying to push ever since and we've we've managed to give give 14 of those large grants away we've given over seven hundred thousand dollars to artists in the past five years so it's it's been a it's been a miracle and it's been a very collective effort thank you i mean i think what's also um well cd maybe you can talk a little bit about your practice leading up to new eagle creek saloon you describe public art as um, being a kind of um, uh, a container for a lot of possibilities and ideas. Um, and so much of your work has um, taken on a public dimension, though, though it's not necessarily about the public, um, or not necessarily in the public in the same way it is about the public. So either representing shared imaginings of the future or bringing to light marginalized figures of well-known historical movements. Um, and always, your work is always sort of navigating the entanglements of the personal and the political. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit about your practice leading up to New Eagle Creek Saloon um, and how, how that kind of um, then opened up a space for, for New Eagle Creek. Um, sure, thank you. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank everybody, you know, for pulling together and pulling it together and being together in this way. Um, it's just such a challenging time. I feel like, you know, some of the bright side that I've seen in this moment is like a real 
openness and tenderness even um, amongst like strangers um, or amongst like this weird, you know, Zoom situation. Um, and so, you know, even like I was doing like some, um, you know, like when you have to wait on the phone on hold and you get like a stranger in some other city to talk about like whatever automated thing and then just kind of winding up talking about like, well, where are you and mm -hmm. are you safe and what's going on? And I just feel like there's an openness and I'm trying to um, cultivate that um, while also I feel the need to kind of say when we do gather in these like digital spaces that my hope for the future is that this in no way replaces any of our other ways of coming together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been a lot of um, attention on like some of the problematic natures of Zoom. I always like to remind people like it's not a secure platform. Um, and so I just feel like maybe if every time I come together at one of these things, I just kind of put that seed out there that I hope, you know, no one's job um, gets relegated to like just existing on the internet. Um, but to say all that, I also just want to thank like so many um, important friends and family members who were a huge part of the Eagle Creek that are joining us this morning, you know, all from different places and different circumstances in life. And, um, you know, those people is really what this project is about. Um, and my work has always been about my family and inspired by my family, um, whether that's, you know, in the forefront of the work or more behind the scenes. Um, it's just always been a way that I've engaged with my family um, has just been kind of in awe of the the magic, the power, the survival, and the poetry that is um, maintained and created in our family spaces. So whether it's you know big family reunions or just living room dance parties or arguing about politics or um, telling stories, it's just um, to me been like this real generative um meaty you know stuff of life that happens in these spaces despite of and in reaction to all of the hard things that um you know my family has survived as like you know black american families in this country have and continue to do um and i think with the work it's also um kind of about listening and just um kind of paying attention to the material that's coming my way and deciding what to do with it at that moment. Um, I think a lot of the way that I work with the, the public or engaging with an audience, I think of it as um, a type of love letter. Um, and I think even like Essence um, Hardin has also written about my work in that way. So in a way it's kind of a solitary act often. So it isn't necessarily um, like, you know, the way that my practice works, I don't, you know, set up to engage with a bunch of people in a different community or go interview people. It's more like me composing a love letter, which is for everybody, but from a kind of solitary um, place that hopes to then invite people after the fact. Um, I also think about like the way that James Baldwin talked about um, being a witness as a and kind of differentiating that from being like necessarily on the front lines, um, which is like often very much how I think about Dina. I'm like, you are in there on the front lines making these daily decisions um, to move this forward. But I think of my practice as kind of um, a witnessing in that way. Um, and I guess that kind of leads up to this project, which is quite a bit different and I can get into explaining it, but I don't know if if that part's yeah let's let's do that and um i think we can maybe pull up um some of the images that you shared with us yeah that would be that would be great um yeah. i think um yeah maybe if we get like one of the bar um this you know project in case anybody like just doesn't have any idea i'll try to just briefly um introduce it so my the project is an homage, it's a monument and also an altar and also a living, breathing bar um, that pays tribute to my father's bar, which was the new Eagle Creek Saloon, um, which was located on in the 1800 block of Market Street in San Francisco um, from 1990 to 93. And it was um, really 
um, a community center, a gathering space, um, a pooling of resources for folks who were marginalized, um, you know, quite proactively um, disenfranchised and excluded from the white gay bar scene at the time. Um, so, you know, the way that my father um, has talked about it, it wasn't necessarily like, oh, you know, I've got this entrepreneurial idea, I want to run a bar. It was more like, uh, my friends need a space to be safe, to be seen, to be together, um, you know, to be in our dignity and in our power. And so when he had the opportunity to set up this bar, that's what he did. Um, and I really can't stress enough, like, um, how active the racism that they were experiencing was. Um, it wasn't just kind of like a few anecdotal incidents. It was such a rampant practice, the discrimination that was happening that um, the city actually had to pass a law that said, you know, bars couldn't ask people for three forms of ID because this was something that was, um, you know, plaguing the black and brown um, and like interracial clientele at the bars. Um, I hope I'm like doing this justice mm -hmm. since Rodney Barnett may or may not be on the call, um, <laughs> but I, um, you know, from what from what I take away from this, it was really um, kind of an extension of my father's activism throughout his entire life, whether that was with the Black Panthers, with Angela Davis, or working as a union representative for nurses. Um, you know, I think this bar was very much in line with creating space um, for people to, to be themselves and to be in their power and to be celebrated and also to laugh and be silly and be sexy and dance and um, all of that. And so, um, I kind of always knew that I wanted to do a project about the bar and I knew that it would have to be a bar in itself. Um, it just seemed like I couldn't make pictures about a bar. I had to just make a bar and on what scale that would exist. I really had no idea until um, Dina was like, hey, we got these two grants at the same time. You know, we can make this happen on a pretty large scale. Um, and so this project, you know, was birthed at the lab in this space, um, really to, you know, satisfy the desire to bring the Eagle Creek back to life. Um, we were able to invite former patrons of the bar to come and experience it. So it almost felt like a, a family reunion um, and in some ways like a memorial also. Um, as people like really talked about how important that space had been to them and that it's no longer there. Um, so we did three events. I guess the events were really like, you know, the, the meat of it. Um, we were able to invite Rashad Pridgen to do an amazing uh, dance ritual offering. The Black Aesthetic Collective did a film screening. Uh, we did a talk with my dad and um, his friend Stephen Dorsey, who's a big figure in the community. Um, we did, you know, dance parties. We had a warrior's watch party <laughs> back when there was basketball. Um, so it was just um, really special. And then we also took the entire thing to San Francisco Pride, which both really came from Dina's encouragement. And also, I think, you know, Dina, once she heard that my father's bar had participated in SF Pride, it was like, well, obviously we have to do that by any means necessary. Um, and when we designed the bar, um, we made sure that it was going to fit on a flatbed truck. Mm -hmm. And so that was always kind of a part of it. Um, and I will say like the making of the bar was as much a family project as when my dad um, set up the bar. So my dad's brothers helped him do the electricity, remodel the bathroom, really make it a beautiful space. I think it was important to him that if it was going to be the only black owned gay bar in San Francisco, it was going to be like really legit, beautiful, classy. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to be able to work with my now partner on fabricating this, which totally exploded the possibilities of probably what I could have done or what we could have afforded in terms of um, production. So we were able to build kind of the dream bar. Um, and then my partner's mother came up and drove the truck when we had it in Pride. Um, and so just through and through, it kept on being, you know, this real, um, family project in a way that really was beautiful and mirroring the original project. I love that. Well, I mean, well, I think I also <laughs> threw in a couple of my own pictures from, um, <laughs> from um, 
coming to one of the events at the lab. Um, and I, and Sadie, if you could talk a little bit more about the aesthetics of this of the space, and particularly um, around uh, the the glow and the glitter, um, which are long parts of your practice, um, but but you know why why is that important? And I'm and I'm thinking especially right now, like since we're all in this moment of being in these interior in our interior spaces, in a way that um, you know that we really have to you know we find ourselves at least I find myself trying to adorn them in different kinds of ways, right? To um, you know to to bring beautiful things around me um, to find to find the light. Right, and to find and find the green, um, but if you could talk a little bit about um, you know the glitter, the glow, and the adornment of the project mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a really important aspect. a lot of you know um, people ask like, is this what the bar looked like and <laughs> I'm like, not at all I think um, <laughs> I mean a part of it was that we didn't have a lot of um, images of the original bar. So the idea of recreating it kind of went out the window, as well as the fact that the lab is just a huge space. And so the idea of kind of turning the walls of the lab into the walls of the bar didn't seem like an option. So I thought, well, let's make more of like a kind of beacon that exists in the center of the room and the rest of the space kind of disappears or, um, you know, is it didn't really disappear in reality it ended up kind of just um you know folding in the entire space around the bar by people's energy and dancing and moving throughout the space um but that was you know kind of the practical reasons for making it um more like this beacon or monument and i figured it would be the most powerful one if i honored my voice and kept it in my aesthetic which is often um just related to this kind of um, maybe a kind of speculative space, a glittering, alive magic potential space, um, not in like denial of any of the pain or difficulty, but more like in kind of righteous spite of it um, and saying like, never, you know, have my ancestors and those that I'm inspired by waited for like, liberation or freedom in order to be fabulous, in order to shine, in order to um, allow others to shine. And so to me, that's really what this glitter is about. Um, it's also, you know, it demands some attention. It takes up some space. Um, it creates also like just a, a beautiful light that I do think um, is kind of a part of this like, you know, mood um, and like vibe of being in a bar and kind of feeling yourself with like a nice, pink light that's very flattering um, and romantic. Um, yeah, so I think that's, I think it, it didn't, it doesn't look like the bar, but it feels like what I imagined the bar to feel like. Mm -hmm. which I think when you're remembering something, you always want to, um, you know, maybe like a rose colored glasses and it becomes like bigger than life. Um, so yeah, that's the <laughs> yeah, no, and I love also there are all these um, these objects, right? That are always that are part of the installation, and part part of it that are um, you know about kind of what the feeling might be, and also that are like like the photographs, right? That are these sort of um, uh, allude to the kind of to touch, right? So I mean, again, I guess also thinking about all the all the ways we connect and, and that we can't, but we can't touch right now, right? Like we can't be physically in the same space, but the way that a photograph, right, is an invitation to, to closeness, um, right? These, uh, the, the crushed um, beer cans or soda cans, right, or invitate that the album covers, right? All of these objects that are, um, about the haptic that you have um, placed right throughout um, that is a very different kind of engagement um, with with the the um, uh, you know that like even these hands right that we're looking at right here right um, and I think that's just so so important for us in this moment 
um, as well. Dina, do you want to share anything about um, the collaboration from your side and sort of how you envisioned um, or kind of um, <laughs> or, or couldn't imagine, right, um, what this might have been for the um, for the lab? Oh, and you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> Always, always do that. Um, I, yeah, I couldn't have possibly imagined how absolutely exuberant, joyful, prismatic, um, resonant this project would be. Um, I, I mean, I, cr I cried multiple times just out of sheer joy of, of being there and being able to witness it and being a part of it. And um, I think the funny thing about my role at the lab or the role that I've tried to create in some ways, she perform, it's, it's not really, it's not totally, it doesn't totally work out this way, but I really want it to be a process of ungoverning, of, of really like handing the keys over, handing the money over and just letting it be and really like an anti-curatorial stance in many ways. Um, and this was one of those projects that, that showed me how absolutely rich that experience we could be i mean sadie is a master at what she does and absolutely can handle all the ins and outs of the project so much so that i was just like oh my god like how can i help i need to i need to be able to i need to be able to support you more um but just the not only the technical expertise of understanding um what it meant to create a kind of community altar in this way of just something that was beautiful and wild and still had an ingrained sense of freedom, but also something that was conceptually so resonant. Um, and, it, and it allowed us an access point and a, and a viewpoint on a, a world and a way of being in the world that uh, I think is, is difficult to access in our everyday life experience. So seeing that and being able to actually be a part of, of that reification of that viewpoint and seeing the, the kind of like form of the thing coming together but also just the like Sadie's singular viewpoint um also expanding prismatically into this collective collective space in this collective process was such a such an amazing amazing thing I, I just there was not a single moment where I was like what, what are we doing what's going on <laughs> and that's extremely rare it was wonderful um, since we have um, actually a lot of your collaborators here, um, or public co-contributors is what um, Paul Farber of Monument Lab has called them, um, I'm actually wondering if anybody would want to unmic themselves um, and say a few words, um, maybe um, Rodney Barnett, say his dad, or um, I don't know who else is is on the line, but to to kind of you know we actually have the opportunity since we're like not in a theater on a stage with microphones um, to be a little bit more horizontal if people feel open to talking about what that process was like or what it was like to the experience of being on the float and pride, which is in my understanding I think from what you've said, Sadie is um, uh, one of the first or uh, first black pride floats or? Um... I mean, when, um, I think when my father, um, and again, you know, thank you for inviting other folks to participate. I'll let you guys think for a while if you wanted to. Um, mm -hmm. Even also, I don't know if you want to say anything about the process of making it, but, um, you know, from my understanding, when my dad's, um, it was really a matter of the patrons of the bar, the community coming together and saying like, Rodney, we have to, do this float. We have this amazing, you know, multiracial community, and we don't really see that reflected in Pride. So we need to get out there and show it. So it was always my understanding that it felt like the first, you know, mm -hmm. real presence of like a black owned and operated float in Pride. Um, it's kind of, you know, hard to quantify right, those right. things per se, but that was always um, my feeling of it. Um, and I guess I'll just also quickly say, because I just, um, you know, after D hearing Dina speak, I mean, um, I'm glad that was her experience. I felt like I 
was like, I don't know what's happening. And I felt like Dina was such a rock and um, this w had this way of being really grounded, but also like limitless mm -hmm. and um, to feel like really free, but also really supported was amazing. And I honestly, you know, think that the, la the lab and Dina were a huge part of the project feeling the way that it felt. Um, I think a lot of what I heard people talk about being at the events um, was it just felt like there wasn't a way to perform in that space that normally there always is. So if you're at a bar or you're at an art event or you know, you're at church or you're at a family reunion, there's like these kind of ways that you're supposed to behave. But I feel like um, people were telling me that they kind of felt free of all of those expectations and constraints at the New Eagle Creek Saloon. And I think it was because of the lab and the way that that space is so flexible and powerful, but also kind of can recede and let something else, mm -hmm. you know, kind of be like um, greater than a, the sum of its parts, if that makes sense. And so to me, every time I talk about this project, every time I think about it, the lab is such a huge part of why it um, really took off and became bigger than any of us in a way that I like still get teary eyed when I think about it. it was like the best art thing that I had ever <laughs> been to or been a part of. And I feel like I can say that without so sounding self aggrandizing because at that point it really wasn't about me. Um, it was about like everybody and those who had come before and it, um, that's all. Well, I think it's, you know, it's one of the things that's, you know, that Dina said about, you know, that it's not art be not being a financial proposition or just like thinking of the ways that that we make art as part or people make art as part of survival and we, you know, like um, engage in part of it, but also as a as a community endeavor. And I actually, I feel a little teary eyed because there is something really powerful about the what you're talking about is the kind of the freedom that can be found in, in collectivity right um and in like you know kind of producing this a uh, shared something right that we all get to participate in that we get to bring our best selves to or you know maybe our messiest selves to as well right um but these you know this the ways in which we're you know um i think so much of our culture demands um the kind of like individual success or individual specificity that um uh you know or this right the singular name as opposed to the community effort um that is you know what i think for at least you know, my experience of visiting the lab and visiting New England Creek Saloon was really, um, uh, you know, was palpable, was, was incredibly palpable. Um, sorry, I'm, I feel very like <laughs> inarticulate and emotional. And I think um, just also very grateful for this, um, uh, you know, like the articulation of a certain, moving towards freedom um but yeah so before i just i like completely break down into tears in front of all of our parents um <laughs> um maybe well i don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on this or i wanted to ask a question about the bay area specifically okay well um I guess the question that I wanted to sort of for us to think about since um, both of you are so rooted in this in this place um, in the Bay Area place um, and the landscape has changed so dramatically um, we started our semester uh, one of the first people we we met with was Jeff Chang who talked about um, gentrification as a process of resegregation um, in the Bay Area um, and wanted to ask you you know what this work what your practices your curatorial practices your art practices mean um, for you in the changing 
landscape of the Bay Area and specifically how, um, how can we support, um, continue to commit, commit to supporting artists and other arts laborers in the context of gentrification and resegregation? Uh, I guess I, I can talk to that briefly. Um, I mean, I think growing up in Oakland, being born and raised in Oakland, um, the kind of speed and velocity through which we've seen gentrification um, does feel pretty violent and does feel like um, an erasure, um, you know, specifically of our Black population, um, but also of just so many other um, things and types of spaces in our city. And again, I think I kind of go back to, I think one of the reasons I moved back to the Bay Area in 2016 um, was because I wanted to just kind of witness this. And um, I felt like if I wasn't here, I wouldn't even recognize the city, you know, mm -hmm. when I came back every six months or so. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I think you know, to think about the way of Jeff Chang thinking of it as like a resegregation, I think is important because we often talk about gentrification, you know, as if it starts from now and moves forward without thinking about the deinvestment that allowed the, you know, these spaces to become prone to gentrification in the first place. And it kind of feels accidental or anecdotal. And I think both of those things are really misleading. It's also not inevitable. So I definitely am always trying to look at like the structural ways that this is happening, you know, um, through like zoning and tax breaks and um, things that are happening 10 years before you actually see them, you know, manifested in the city. Um, and I guess to the second part of the question, you know, I think how we can support artists is just the same way that we can support anybody and everybody, um, which is through like, you know, housing, <laughs> healthcare, dignity. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, artists will be uplifted when all vulnerable communities are uplifted and I think especially in this moment you know we're having um, a really clear picture painted of like what can happen when literally everything is for sale like mm -hmm. when health is for sale it's it's not a good situation um, you know I don't think that housing should um, be so tied to like a financial market either um, and so yeah I guess I don't really separate what artists need you know from what all like working people need mm -hmm. I think though um, they'll get, you know, they'll get what they need when everyone gets what they need, or as we all fight to take what we need. Um, yeah. yeah, I totally agree with that. It's, we can't separate the, the situation of artists from the situation of nurses right now, or the situation mm -hmm. of, of people who are immigrants who are coming, um, who are really suffering the consequences of, of, what capital has, how capital has destroyed our urban, our urban landscape, our rural landscape, our ways of being together. Um, and it's, it's been, you know, I think this process of getting older and becoming more of an adult and also watching and um, being in a city for a dozen years now and watching it kind of slowly be dismantled by capital and slowly be all of the kind of the voices and the cacophony and the class structures become totally homogenized um, or become so disparate that we have 40,000 homeless and you know uh, and also you know however many billionaires like it just doesn't none of this makes any sense and it, it's not a city it's not the type of urban life that any of us want to be in and and I think that goes for pretty much everybody. If you look at a, a city that um, feels completely safe, whatever that word means, it's not a city that provides you with the capacity to jump outside of yourself and see the world differently and to see the world anew um, and to actually experience perspectives that are not your own. And I think we're coming up against that in every aspect of our daily lives. And we're beginning to realize that our discourse has become so relegated by financial systems and so relegated by um, you know, like Facebook's algorithms and Google's algorithms and everything that we're all speaking into this, you know, very, this, this set of, of voices that are acceptable 
and the acceptable points of view and the comfortable points of view and the the ways that it's not the ways that we want to be be together in the world you know i don't think any of us really want that we have just somehow been um, scared into believing that this is this is a, a appropriate way to do things and so i think it's a matter of just demonstrating i think this is one thing that art spaces can do in the space of art can can provide for us is a space like a, a safe space to actually experience the difficulty and the discomfort of having to exceed yourself and having to leave your own perspective and return to another and see another way of seeing, um, another way of sensing the world. Um, Fred Moten has this beautiful term that he picks up from Edouard Glissant that is is called um, "I consent." I consent to not being consent to not being a single being. And to me, that the consent says everything. Consent to not being a single being. It's not. It's not like uh, it's it's actually welcoming into your body the possibility of other voices and other ways of being and actually allowing yourself to change and become non singular in that way. Um, so I really I think we're at a very critical moment where we can start renegotiating the ways that we are together and the ways that we experience the world together. And we can start renegotiating on a very material and pragmatic le level like that that urban landscape and we can start listening to the nurses and we can start talking to the janitors and we can start bringing the immigrants back into the, the like actual perceptual guidelines and saying like this perspective, this way of seeing the world is so informative. There's so much absolute inherent knowledge in that. Um, so giving that space back for that knowledge to actually teach us again, um, teach us new ways of being is very key. So yes, I mean, the, the decimation of the Bay Area is absolutely palpable. Um, and I think um, it's, it's up to us now to reimagine it. Well, we're I'm gonna open it up to questions in a moment. Um, I wanna give everybody a, a chance to gather their questions and figure out the technology. So you can either, um, folks can use their, their chat function, um, and type a question that um, either Lauren or I will read, or you can, um, you know, do the little hand raise um, <laughs> sign or whatever, and um, we'll you can call on you to unmute yourself while you're thinking about that. Um, oh, right. So you, uh, the chat. Can people see Lauren pointing to the chat function? Okay, it's at the bottom. Um, Honestly, like I feel like doing when I'm doing this, I feel like I'm a DJ who's trying to cook a meal while driving um, in this like whole thing. But anyway, um, uh, but the last question I want to ask you both. Um, so for their final projects, our students are um, designing or imagining or sort of proposing new public art for the campus specifically, for UC Berkeley campus specifically. Um, and so the question we've, we've posed to most of our guests uh, previously has been, what kind of public art, new public art, would you like to see, or could you imagine seeing in the Bay Area? Um, if you have any thoughts about that uh, at this moment. At one point for me, it was, you know, renaming um, the, the building where I work because it's named for um, uh, an imperialist uh, anti <laughs> Filipino, um, you know, uh, figure, but now I feel like I would just want to do hands across America. <laughs> it's very, it's very real and iterative. Um, like what we can do in public space. And I think just acting weird in public is revolutionary on its own. <laughs> and I think there's ways of, of acting out and being in public space um, that is profoundly artistic simply because it's bringing in things that are normally cloistered in um, 
you know, bar environments or, or uh, home environments or churches or things like that, that can actually be made public and made visible in a clear way. And we can, like, just by making the, the act of being together public and visible, we can actually produce something very different. And things can be made in that space and renamed and, and, and hands can be brought together. And it's, <laughs> it's kind of a, I think creating an architecture for freedom for that, that space to exist is, is much easier than trying to like create something that's permitted by the city or, <laughs> or like has a million um, um, degrees of bureaucracy um, tied up into it. So that's a proposal. Like that, yeah. Sadie, any thoughts? Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess, of course, I'd love to see something that I can't even know that I want to see. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, I guess I like to, if it was going to be some kind of like advice or something, would with like, um not to start with the end, you know, of like what it's gonna look like or what you want to see, but just paying attention to what's around and what you're obsessed with and what's moving you and listening to what makes the most sense um, to honor that inquiry or moment or space. Um, yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, thank you. So, um, Lauren, do you want to start to facilitate the questions? Um, one from Ben Sassman is asking for Sadie, what projects are you planning to work on next? And what did you do with the bar after it was in the lab? Um, yeah, those are both good questions. The, the bar um, continues to have a life, it traveled, to Los Angeles um, and we did an exhibition at um, the Institute of Contemporary Art um, in downtown LA and um, it was it was interesting I learned a lot you know from kind of watching the bar shift to a different space and more of like a traditional museum space um, which had you know some advantages and some disadvantages and some challenges and I think the bar itself really spoke you know, loudly to me and let me know that um, it really wants enough space, um, both like literal space and also just kind of like um, an unbranded space or something like that to really be itself. And so uh, Dina and I hope to continue to travel the bar to different cities and different um, institutions while also figuring out how to maintain the integrity of the bar itself as its own um, space that like we're all kind of listening to and responding to um, so I hope you know people kind of stay tuned and I'm definitely hoping that um, when we're all allowed to be together again the bar can be a big part of that um, currently the bar is in my studio um, it just came back a bit ago I'm very fortunate enough to have a big enough studio that I could set the bar up and I was really looking forward to doing like some speakeasies um, and kind of like, you know, secret in between um, art and life moments in the studio space. And I certainly hope um, that one day we can do that as well. Um, you guys will be the first to know. Um, and a project that I'm working on right now, it's actually up right now. I haven't really told anybody or posted about it. Um, it's like in the streets and no one is allowed to be in the streets. Um, but it was through the San Francisco Arts Commission, they do those um, bus stop mm -hmm. kiosk poster takeover. So there's 36 posters, six different designs that pay tribute to the Eagle Creek Saloon um, and kind of trying to capture some of the like um, alter space holding that happened at the Eagle Creek mm -hmm. Saloon the second one, trying to kind of cre recreate some of that in a photographic, um, you know, frame. Um, and so those posters are up now. Um, they just went up like in the 
middle of March, I guess. Um, my dad was like all set to come up and check them out. I was really looking forward to like, you know, having a bottle of champagne and really honoring the fact that these posters are on Market Street, which is where the bar was. And the name of the um, series is called The New Eagle Creek Saloon Was Here. So it's really like, um, you know, another way of kind of, I was thinking about like, you know, maybe the like bronze plaques that go up and honor spaces that are no longer there and thinking really about like monuments. And so those posters are up, I guess, if you're in San Francisco and you're doing an essential errand on Market Street, you can check them out. Maybe I'll figure out how to, you know, photograph them. Um, but I just, I don't know, I haven't really been inspired to um, tell people to go look at them. I think, you know, a lot of artists are kind of figuring out in this moment, like, mm -hmm. how do I respond or not respond? How do I make work? How do I be still and be quiet and listen also? And so that's kind of where I'm at. No, I think um, I keep coming back to uh, this um, Saidia Hartman line, you know, all her genius was exhausted just trying to live. And I feel like we're just trying to kind of figure out how to be in this new moment. And it, it's taking all of our kind of creativity and, um, and genius to kind of manage that. Um, but we will look for it. And maybe the folks who are in San Francisco who are taking their, you know, their daily constitutional might um, look for those kiosks. Um, there's another question from Vincent um, for Dina. What are you working on now? Um, how are you feeling about moving the lab to virtual spaces? Um, and I guess a question, how will the effects of coronavirus set the stage for new forms of public art expression? Mm. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Vincent. <laughs> that was... <laughs> so, <Easy yeah>. <laughs> I, I had this feeling of, I think we all had a feeling of paralysis after we, it, it was just this paralysis, fear, anxiety, grief, um, after we started being quarantined um, and a feeling of loss, like genuine loss. We lost so much. We lost our ability to be together. We lose the potential futures that we were, had been imagining up until this trajectory. We lost, um, income we lost uh you know hopefully not anyone here but family members and our elders and the wisdom um that all of that brings and just thinking back of, um about all of it so i i have just been i've been like just asking myself as many questions as i can and of course not answering any of them sufficiently but um after after the news i kind of just let the lab go a little quiet for a bit and just I, I replace we normally have a video in our background of the lab and I just replaced it with an empty an image of the empty lab itself as kind of just a, a memorial or a marker to the space and we're going to launch finally after percolating on it a lot and and reading a lot of different texts about people who have existed in moments like these I've decided that we're going to create this this thing online for the lab that's called the forum and the forum will be a space for debate. And it's gonna be a, uh, we're bringing in, our first one will be on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And it's with Astra Taylor, who's mm -hmm. one of the spokespeople for the Debt Collective. And so we're really gonna talk about what it means to strike debt and if we can, and what, what situations will lead up to um, making us as citizens more debt free than we have been before and um, not obligated to to care for, to take care of these uh, speculative financial situations. Um, and I feel like that is, and, and after she speaks for 40 minutes, we're gonna have 30 minutes of moderated public debate with Jacques Laurence, who's going, he's a Haitian immigrant and he has a whole other idea about what debt means worldwide and globally and how imperial structures have created the sense of debt. And this ties back into art because I believe that it's very much, um, art is very much a space for renegotiating value and renegotiating our values. And I'm really thinking about how the lab can provide an excess of care right now and really demonstrate and model this reimagining of the world that we need. So basically that's my first foray into programming in the time of Corona. 
and I will we'll see. It's an experiment, and hopefully, like from that, we'll have biweekly um, forums in which people will speak, give their expertise, and then everybody will kind of join under this hat of being together in common to debate whether or not the possibilities of that proposition. That's great. Um, I think right there was a question as well about. Um, uh, about how to to wield the tools and affordances um, of social networking sites and um, these really imperfect, um, you know, potentially dangerous, but also you know the tools that we have right now um, in this moment. I think that's a great answer to that question. Um, I will. Um, there are a couple more questions. Um, and then um, we'll finish. One, I, I, I like this question a lot um, for Sadie. Um, as a huge fan, um, this is from Noah, who's a huge fan of science fiction, um, who was intrigued to read that your art exhibited scenes of a galactic escape. Um, and it was, <laughs> Noah was wondering where this theme comes from and how you feel it affects your work. Um, yeah, great question and so tempting in moments like these I think to just think of like another place another plane um that's available and to me it exists both as like you know um an outer space um plane but it could also be like an a headspace plane and thinking more about like um you know transcendence or ecstasy or enlightenment um, within as like this kind of potential plane that's right there underneath the surface of our like dysfunctional um, reality and minds, um, as well as in a more narrative um, way, actual like outer space and space travel and time travel um, as these kind of like available modes. Um, so I think a lot of it comes from um, inspirations like Outcast um, and even Little Wayne and of course Sun Ra um, and like particularly with um, mm -hmm. you know the film Space is a Place like taking mm -hmm. space um, taking place like really particularly in, my, in Oakland um, and just kind of that inquiry of um, I think it's kind of like shining light on how far away our earth experience is from the reality of what we are imagining that all people deserve um that it kind of like to really acknowledge how far that distance is it seems like you got to go all the way to space um mm -hmm. um i think like you know in my work the world that i'm imagining is so radically different than where we are. Like, I'm not imagining a different president um, or, you know, in my other projects that have had to do with like state surveillance, you know, I'm not imagining like a different director of the same FBI. I'm imagining like right. a way in moving in relationship to each other in the land that's so different that I can't even fully explain it. And so those, um, outer space places kind of um, hold that like abstraction to me and also mm -hmm. honor the fact that just because you can't imagine it doesn't mean it isn't possible or that it isn't coming. And that takes a lot of um, kind of faith in, um, in the process and in that kind of ability to, to um, you know, approach or, or move towards something, right? Without having to have a kind of complete picture at the end, which I think is a really powerful um, way of thinking about, you know, your process, that it's not, you know, that you're not trying to kind of realize a fully formed vision in your, in your head. But I mean, even as you said, sort of getting at a kind of, you know, a, the feeling of both what a past might have felt that like, but also what a future might feel like, right? Um, Okay, so two more questions. Um, one is um, um, 
there, I guess there are a lot of questions for you, Sadie, about people, uh, if you, uh, uh, the kind of reception of your work or, or misinterpreting. So how, when you're making work, do you worry about how your love letter will be, will be received? Um, I mean, I guess, um, yes and no. Um, I mean, I guess as far as like, you know, um, like artistic integrity or artistic excellence. I mean, I always worry um, if something is gonna, you know, be good enough. Um, so there's that, and that's like my own standard and the standard of like my mentors and the opportunities that I feel I've been afforded, um, you know, wanting to really live up to that. Um, I guess as far as like, you know, the, the audience and whether things will be misinterpreted, that part doesn't bother me so much because I know that there always will be um, people who maybe it's um, it's going to meet different people where they're at. And there's going to be some people who understand, you know, one set of references and some people who understand another set of references. And then there'll be another group that understands both. And that's really cool. Um, but I feel like there's always something available for different entry points. Um, and there's also kind of some secret messages or, you know, treasures um, for people who might, you know, understand the kind of little secret shout out and under and I'm okay with other people not understanding that because that's kind of what makes it special and what makes it um, specific, if that answers. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, well, the last, so the last question, I'm sort of trying to figure out, there's a question for you, Dana, about, um, about an, being, um, as an anarchist, how you understand um, public art and society. Um, but I kind of want to fold it into um, this last question, how do we gauge success? How do you gauge success? Um, and, um, and I don't know if you could <laughs> speak to success from an anarchist point of view. <laughs> Wow, it's really out there. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I will say that I think of anarchism as an ethics, not as a, as a, a system or a way of being. It's exactly the opposite. It, it literally allows the human to prevail over systems so that human beings can actually create the systems that they live and work under, not necessarily the other way around. So that's all anarchism is for me in a nutshell. It's just putting the human first and our lives and ways of being um, collectively before before that um, the systems in which we have to prevail under so um, you know I'm ethically an anarchist but I think of Marxism as a you know social interesting social experiment uh, thought experiment and creating a better system um, so I, I success <laughs> success within this framework is is pretty simple it is that project project of working towards freedom. And it is something that it can only be shared. It's only, it's only something that it, if it's success on your own terms for yourself, then it means nothing. It's useless. It's not, it's not, um, if it's only for you, then it's not actually success. It's just, uh, it's, it's a conceit. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what it means to have a project that iterates success generatively within a community. And so what success might look like if it were, cap were capable of being a contagion, not to use a word that's too, mm. too possible right now, but it, if it allowed other people to, um, to, feel, that, to, to feel that jointly um, alongside of us. And also iterated into a new project and a new form of being. Um, so that, that's basically my only standard right there. <laughs> Yeah. Any last words, Sadie? Um, I guess I'll just say, like thinking about success and I don't exactly know, you know, how to describe it, but I remember this moment um, a couple times at the lab and definitely on the float when it was like this, the moment felt so complete and so like manifested. Mm -hmm. um, that I was like, you know, this is, this is so 
everything. I just want to like, I want to tell everybody and I want to share it, but I also don't care if anyone ever knows because this moment is so complete in itself that it's not dependent on like being shared or liked or understood or repeated. And to me, I think for this project, that's what um, success was was like something that's so complete that you kind of want people to know about it but that doesn't even matter because it's like it's actually the thing is the thing and it's right there it's right there um and it's and it's magic and um i guess just in closing i just you know want to thank again dina um i really felt like you were like a warrior sister <laughs> throughout the whole process um i mean it I just, I'm so happy to have like, you know, a kind of public moment to just really thank and appreciate you for that work um, that, you know, you really um, put like magic and fairy dust and fire behind this project, <laughs> all while also like trying to save the lab um, for all of the other future projects that are going to be happening. Um, and then I just, you know, Lee and Lauren want to thank you guys for continuing your work and inviting me to be a part of it in different ways. Um, and to all of, all of our families. I mean, I think we have three of our mothers on <laughs> this call right now. Um, and I just really, um, you know, appreciate, um, family consistently showing up for each other and, um, to my dad for, you know, um, trusting me with the story and really, um, you know, celebrating together. It's just been a, a real joy that I think we're all um, really appreciating in this moment of separateness. I miss you and the Eagle Creek every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and moments like this where we're all gathering, you know, just, it would just be nice in person. But um, yeah, thank you. Thank you all. And, and Sadie, that what you made was a just an extraordinary, an extraordinary experience for all of us to be, um, to be able to be with. And hopefully we'll see it again, you know, across yeah. the world somewhere Definitely. soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You um, think Bloom will ride again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thank you both so much. Well, and, and, and until it rides again, here's to tenderness and fairy dust. Um, you know, and our, our commitment to building towards freedom. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you everyone who joined us. Um, and hopefully you can, you know, if you want to join us again, we're here again on Thursday and you can use the same, um, the same link. <laughs>